All right. So thanks, Levin, for <clears throat> have, waking up early in the morning to, uh, <laughs> to uh, give this talk. Um, should be a really exciting one on uh, scalable quantum processors and simulators um, that they're working on at Delft. So take it away. All right. Well, uh, thanks, JP. It's a nice opportunity um, with all the travel canceled. I've hardly given any uh, talks, and so it's nice to be part or feel part of the scientific community again a little bit in this way. Um, I have a bunch of slides prepared, but I can also uh, skip some. Uh, so do please uh, feel free to, to ask questions along the way if something isn't clear, because you know after all, I'd like to to uh, tell you something that you know that uh, that lands. Um, of course, we're all you know working in this in this field. I've been working in it since '97, um, and and these days there's really you know a lot of momentum. Uh, I've been working in this field for a long time. It was always active and exciting, but but it's really been been ramping uh, ramping up a lot in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and, and the newspapers are asking, you know, is the computer quantum computer already there? Um, and, and of course, there is the, the big announcement with Google last fall, where they managed to control more than 53 qubits with actually amazing fidelity. So it's a really impressive experiment and, and a great technical achievement that I admire uh, a lot. Um, it's, of course, also the first time that a quantum computer achieved a complexity that no supercomputer could, could match anymore. Although, you know, it, it really did so in performing the task of computing itself. Literally a random set of instructions were implemented on this, on this uh, chip and, and uh, it became very hard for a, for a classical supercomputer to compute what the final state was, uh, especially at the, you know, when, when all the qubits were involved. Really impressive experiment, but um, my motivation really from the outset has not been to solve a problem that is that no classical computer can solve and that is useless, but one that is useful, right? So that, that is really what, what drives me. Uh, and the prospect is there, but um, I think it's clear that the number of operations that we need in sequence um, to perform a sequence to solve relevant problems uh, is, is almost for sure going to be beyond uh, what is possible within the coherence time of the, of the qubits. And so that means we will need uh, quantum error correction. And, and of course, you know, we can speculate and hope that, that we can solve relevant problems without it. Okay, but well, that would be fantastic. We'll see, but I think it's clear that there is a strong motivation to be able to build devices that really can offer the qubit counts upwards of a million uh, so that uh, you have enough redundancy built into the system so that errors from decoherence can be recovered. Um, in parallel with these developments, there has been work on semiconductor qubits for, for many years, and uh, basically starting around the year 2000, 2001. Um, and and um, my colleagues and I in Delft have been part of these other groups at Harvard, Tokyo, other places. Um, the early work was based on, on chips made from gallium arsenide. It was a well-controlled, well-studied material, a good starting point, uh, in which we were able to demonstrate all the basic elements of what constitutes a quantum processor in the solid state. And in which coherence times, well, T1s, you know, this, the, the relaxation times uh, with energy exchange to the bat were already really long, up, up, to, up to a second. Um, but where uh, dephasing times were very short, uh, you could extend them with dynamical decoupling, but, but still the, the, you know, the system and, and its possibilities uh, have been limited and, and progress have been important. But I don't know, for myself, I, I saw sort of the, uh, I saw it as a dead end uh, road in the end. And I think many colleagues with me, although perhaps not everyone. And the main reason is well understood it is that in gallium arsenide, all the isotopes uh, in, this, in this material uh, carry a nuclear spin. There is no isotope uh, of gallium or arsenic that, that doesn't have a nuclear spin. And they affect the electron spin through the hyperfine interaction. And, and uh, the nuclear spins are randomly oriented, despite the fact that we operate at very low temperature in dilution refrigerators and in a magnetic field of a few Tesla. And so, you know, the random orientation of the nuclear spins then leads to a random uh, effect on the electron spin that, that defaces it in a matter of tens of nanoseconds. 
So this has changed completely when our community uh, took the step to silicon, and in particular the group at UNSW has been really uh, uh, driving this from early on, uh, where on the bottom right you see an experiment from Andrew Duex group where a T2 star was achieved in a quantum dot that in many ways resembled the ones that we, we use in gallium arsenide, but the substrate was replaced not just by silicon, which achieves a hundredfold improvement in coherence time, that's something that we, re that we reported in Delft, but in isotopically purified silicon 28, offering another hundredfold improvement, so 10,000 times longer coherence times or dephasing times, T2 stars, now instead of tens of nanoseconds, hundreds of microseconds. So that's a great prospect. Um, in, or in the meantime, also the gate fidelities have been uh, quite, quite good. Single qubit fidelities uh, have now been at the level of three nines. Data from Turicha showing here in the middle, uh, data from us showing 92% controlled phase fidelity and the Zurich group achieved the 98% controlled rotation uh, fidelity. So I would say, you know, with these developments, my optimism about how far electron spin qubits in quantum dots can go has changed dramatically. And uh, it has led us to think about a scenario where, where we could really see this scale to the very large qubit numbers that I spoke about earlier, up, upwards of a million. And so this is described in this, in this uh, you could sort of say vision paper that we wrote with uh, a number of, of colleagues, where the basic idea is that we will develop local two-dimensional arrays of quantum dots on the chip. In each quantum dot, we, we place one electron, the spin of each electron is a quantum bit. Um, we think, well, we, we don't know how many of, uh, you know, quantum dots um, will, will comfortably fit in a 2D array. The density is very high. If we were able to fill a square millimeter of these with quantum dots at a typical pitch of a nanometer, that makes for a few billion qubits. In practice, we expect smaller registers than that. And we are uh, working, and I'll show you, on ways to interconnect local registers on the chip, on the same chip, with each other through quantum links. And furthermore, um, we are working on integrating classical electronics to distribute signals on the same chip used, made in the same technology, which is possible because we're working with semiconductors, so you can co-integrate classical and quantum electronics uh, in principle. And, and we believe that this is going to be important to resolve one of the biggest, but also, you know, uh, silliest, if you wish, um, uh, possible roadblocks that, that anyone working on solid state qubits uh, faces, electrically controlled qubits faces. And it is that with the methods of today, um, at least one wire goes to every spin or every qubit on the chip. It's true for us, it's true for Google, it's true for IBM, uh, etc. And that is, you know, a, a, that is a problem if you want to go to the millions. You know, if you take a modern processor chip, there's just something like 2,000 pins that connect the, the billions of transistors that are there to the outside world. Uh, on a memory chip, the, you know, the billions of transistors are connected to the outside world with just a few hundred pins. Um, so we need, there's, there's really no way that we're going to bring millions of wires from outside to a quantum chip. And um, instead, I think we're going to, to have, you know, a reasonable thousands of wires that then need to find their way to all the qubits by having some multiplexing electronics that, that sort of spreads them out. Um, and I'm going to, to come back to the challenges that this, that this brings. But altogether, you know, this, is, this picture is sort of our guiding principle. It's what we are striving towards in my group and I think in, in many groups in our community worldwide. I'm starting with a bit of detail on, on the local registers. You know, where do we stand? What are the challenges? How are we uh, moving forward here? Today, um, several groups have reported bell states, um, fidelities, bell state fidelities of around 90% have been achieved uh, in Delft, Princeton, uh, UNSW. Um, in our group, we also implemented two years ago two quantum, quantum algorithms on, on two qubits, the deutsch sorsa algorithm and the Grover algorithm. Um, as some of you may know, I did my PhD on NMR quantum computing with Ike Choin, 
um, back then at, at Stanford and IBM. And so the, you know, Deutsch Jose algorithm is the first thing that I, on, on two qubits is the first algorithm that I implemented in 98. So for me, it was sort of a coming back after all these years to, to where I started. Um, the last experiment I did for my PhD was to factor 15 using uh, seven spins in a molecule. And so I look forward to doing that again as well with, uh, with quantum dots. Now, um, I mentioned already the, the, uh, the gate fidelity of 92% of on the controlled phase, on the controlled Z. Um, since uh, many of you in the audience, I think, are, are um, from an information theory uh, background, um, I wanted to, to mention that the method we used here, I like a lot. It was introduced by Jonas Helsen from Stephanie Wenger's group uh, in, in QTIC, and um, I think Joe Emerson had a parallel uh, development that, that has many similarities. Um, what, you know, the problem that, that we faced was that um, uh, our fidelities not being great yet made it difficult to concatenate enough gates and still have enough signal left in order to do the standard, you know, two qubit randomized benchmarking and interleaved randomized benchmarking. So then I asked, isn't there a way that we could use for the reference uh, randomized benchmarking sequence, uh, single qubit rotations only, and then interleave, like you can see on the right here, interleave C phase gates in between these single qubit operations. As Jonas explained to me, that's tricky. You cannot just do that. But then he proposed a modified uh, protocol that, that allows us to still uh, uh, do this. The, the reason why you can do it is that, that you do not sufficiently um, randomize or, or you, know, uh, you, you do not sufficiently rotate through your uh, Clifford space, if you wish. Um, and, and you don't mix up the, de the decay channels sufficiently as a, as a result. So what Jonas proposed is a method to then disentangle those three decay channels um, and, and then put together the results in a way that it still allows you to, to extract the, the overall gate fidelity. So in addition to offering the gate fidelity, it also gives you more information about the gate, the, the individual decay channels, channels acting on one qubit at a time, on the other qubit, uh, and, and on two qubits at a time. It also provides us insight in, in uh, correlations between the errors, which I'll skip over here. So it's a very powerful uh, method that I think uh, is, is broadly usable, useful. Um, as we think about scaling up these local registers, we are um, building and measuring at the moment linear arrays of five or six dots. Uh, we've, we're also experimenting with uh, two-dimensional arrays of two by twos. So we, here's an image of a three by three. We haven't gotten very far in that one. Um, the, the gate patterns here are, are uh, inspired by others uh, used previously in the community, UNSW, Princeton, other places, HRL. Um, and, and um, you know, this is, this is uh, really happening. We're, we're moving along uh, as a community. What is good to know also is that um, if, you, if you look at the image of the three by three here, and imagine you want to extend the array to four by four, five by five, and so on. Um, one approach is to bring in more and more gates in multiple layers that are all still able to reach the dots on the inside of the array. You know, you can imagine that it's easy to reach dots on the outside of the array, but you have to come from the top to go over the ones on the outside and arrive at the inside. This gets more and more complex as you add, as you enlarge the array. But um, my colleague Menno Veltors and co-workers in Delft have developed a scheme that shows a way to build an array and you have to make some assumptions about, about uh, the uniformity of, of building it. But if you have sufficient uniformity, um, and I think this is also from the, you know, from the control perspective, interesting to think about, it is actually possible to control independently all the qubits using a crossbar addressing scheme. Crossbar addressing schemes are used in displays and in memories uh, in the simplest way, you know, if you if you energize um, a, a vertical and a horizontal line, and only if you energize both, you adjust the component underneath. And, and so uh, we have uh, come up with a scheme uh, that, that uses this main idea, but then, you know, show how to make it feasible uh, for, for controlling, for universal control of spring qubits in quantum dots. And it's quite remarkable that, that this works and, and um, can be compatible with with error correction and so forth. 
So this is uh, the scaling uh, of the hardware, but after you've built the hardware, um, there's still a lot of work to do. And this has to do with the fact that as visualized on the left, when we try to change um, the quantum, modify the gate, you know, the, the gate potentials and, and, and shape the quantum dot potential landscape, which we need to control how many electrons are on which quantum dot and which we need to, to push electrons close towards each other or separate them again. What we find is that, that there is a lot of crosstalk and, and you know, looking at these gate patterns, you can also see that, that, that a gate here will affect not only the quantum dot uh, uh, right underneath it, but also the quantum dots to the side and also the barrier in between, the tunnel barrier in between. And so um, uh, what we have been doing for some time is to use virtual gates, as we call it, which basically invert this cross capacitance matrix. And um, it's, it's just linear inversion, it's, it's uh, inverting a matrix. But the tricky part has been that we didn't know until recently how to compensate for the crosstalk on the tunnel barriers. Tunnel barriers respond exponentially to gate voltages, whereas potential minima respond linearly to gate voltages. So how, you know, a, a nonlinear de dependence doesn't fit in a, in a simple matrix, so how to deal with that? And so um, we have come up with a method to do that, and, and um, uh, it's described in this paper here. Actually, I forgot to, to add the independent work from uh, John Nichol. Uh, that, that came up with a similar concept. But we can do this now, and it's, it's been very powerful in helping us to, to tune up our devices in a systematic way and, and on a reasonable time scale. Um, what has helped a lot to tune up devices on a re reasonable time scale is to improve our, our detection methods. Um, so here you see how uh, you know, typical measurements that we perform, these measurements tell us how many electrons are on which quantum dot, uh, how they come in in real time, uh, whereas previously each of these frames would have taken, let's say, 15 minutes or so. And, and uh, you can imagine that you know, it, it made a big difference. Um, we have also began to automate uh, this process uh, of initial tune-up, and we're also doing a lot of background calibration after we have uh, started our measurements and tuned up the qubits. Uh, we have some background calibration that keeps everything in check. So I have to say these methods have helped a great deal. Uh, there was a PhD student in my group who um, graduated four years ago or something, three, four years ago. Um, he, he gave a presentation internally and had um, laid out the, the time it took to tune up uh, a quantum dot array as a function of the number of dots. And he had gotten until four. And he projected that it would take us I think the time of a PhD, four years or so, to tune up an eight dot device, uh, just extrapolating his personal experience. But with the methods that I've just shown, we have been able to tune up a eight dot device in a matter of a day. So, so and it can still be more efficient. We're still not at the end of it. So, so I think this is very good. It, it tells us that uh, despite the uniformities, that the non-uniformities that unavoidably exist, and despite the, the crosstalk that exists, we have found a good path to tuning up uh, these devices. In parallel, of course, we are very keen to make the uniformity as good as it can be. And uh, even though we have a great clean room at TU Delft, you know, we, we um, have been interested to team up with the semiconductor industry uh, already for six or seven years. And um, at some point I got in touch with uh, people from Intel and we clicked uh, and, and started the partnership uh, five, five years ago now. And, and the main goal for me of this partnership is to get access to their clean room facilities, the same clean room facilities that they use to fabricate wafer scale, um, um, uh, you know, the, the process to strip that we use today. Um, these clean rooms are optimized for a completely different purpose uh, from our own clean room. Ours is optimized for creative science, for trying new ideas, for uh, giving PhD students and master students access to the tools. Their clean rooms are optimized for ultimate yield, reproducibility, uh, and, and ultimate process control. And so I think um, what we've seen over the past years uh, in this collaboration is, is uh, that 
you know, it takes a long time to build up and ramp up the technology. Uh, but you can see here an image on the top left where, where um, this is a scanning electron microscope image where there is an array of quantum dots underneath uh, here. There's an array of quantum dots underneath here that can be used to sense this first array. Um, a cross section through any of the, or one of these is shown here. So you see two types of gate electrodes that we use to pull in electrons in specific locations. Uh, the, the sideways confinement comes from the fact that along this axis, they have etched the material so that quantum, so, so, so there's really a kind of a, a yeah, a, a fin sticking out in which electrons move and then inside that fin, we shape the potential landscape with the gates. Uh, last fall, we reported um, that as a result of an of a iteration process where every month or so new batches of devices came end of line from their in room um, and where we gave feedback on, on, on the, you know, on the behavior. We had gotten to the stage where, where um, we have um, been able to get really quite, quite uh, decent dots uh, in the many electron regime. It looks very well controlled in the few electron regime where there is less screening. Um, you know, it's, it's still, uh, you still see uh, also disorder like we do in university style dots, but I think we're on a good path. And so I'm hopeful that that is going to, uh, you know, pan out that in the end we'll get uh, better dots than we can make ourselves and that anyone in my group will only want to measure the dots made at Intel anymore. Okay, I'm going to um, transition out to the quantum links, but let me pause to make sure if there, are, if there aren't any questions on what I've covered so far. Any questions, please? Just letting people know that uh, at the moment the unmute function is off. So uh, if you have questions, just uh, raise your hand on the electronic thing uh, or, or write a message in the chat and we'll, we'll keep monitoring it. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let me uh, keep going until somebody raises their, their hand. So on the quantum links, this is, a, I think, a really interesting topic. I'm going to be rather brief on it. Uh, to tell you two experiments that we have performed uh, on the way to achieving coherent quantum links. There is a lot of activity on this in this area and, and a lot, uh, there's a lot of physics in this area. Um, a first approach is to build a superconducting resonator that we borrow from the superconducting qubit community. And um, you then um, make the spin on one end of this resonator talk to a single microwave photon stored inside the resonator and through the resonator talk to another spin at the other end of the resonator. This isn't easy. A single spin, um, well, or let me put it differently, a single microwave photon um, has a tiny magnetic field uh, and, and the coupling of that tiny magnetic field from one microwave photon is too weak to, to the single spin, is too weak to be able to, to coherently exchange information between the spin and the photon. What we do instead is to make the spin talk to the microwave photon indirectly. Um, we make it talk to the electric field component of the microwave photon and we do that um, by, by using a magnetic field gradient so that um, you know, spin and position uh, now, now are connected and so that the electric dipole of the electron being in one location or another location um, um, is now connected to spin. And so then from spin, we connect to position and to, to, to charge, which is then allowing us to connect to the electric field. And even though it's an indirect path, here we have been able to, to achieve the so-called strong coupling regime. This is the regime where uh, it actually is possible to coherently exchange quantum information between the spin and the microwave photon because the coupling strength between them is longer than both the spin dephasing time and then the uh, decay time of, of the microwave cavity. Um, so, so you see here uh, data where we vary on the horizontal axis the magnetic field that gives a spin splitting that is expected to give a linear dependence like here. And then you see the cavity resonance um, or the cavity transmission in color scale and as the spin here 
approaches the cavity resonance, instead of crossing, you see a level of repulsion. A cut through here shows two well-resolved sidebands, uh, telling us that we've achieved the, the, um, the strong coupling regime. Uh, and similar results have been achieved around the same time uh, at, at Princeton and at ETH. Um, now the challenge is how to then also perform a two-qubit gate at a distance between two such pins that hasn't been achieved. We're working hard on it, and I hope that uh, we'll be successful. Um, a completely different method that uh, doesn't introduce superconductors and can be implemented entirely with the same technology as we, as we use for building the quantum dots is to, to literally take an electron and shuttle it, push it from one location on the chip to another location on the chip while preserving uh, phase coherence, while preserving the spin states. And uh, we have performed several experiments in this direction and uh, also Piston Manier at, uh, in Grenoble did this. And, and um, the, you know, where we've gotten now is um, in Gallium Arsenite to uh, build a quantum dot array of four quantum dots like you, can, like you can see here. We start with two electrons on one dot, initialize them in a singlet, and then we pull one electron and separate it out to the second, third, and fourth dot. And then um, from there, there, there we wait a little bit. Um, the, the, the spins evolve, they also deface. And then we bring them back and we project in the single triplet measurement basis. And what you see plotted here is the oscillation that takes place when the spins are separated. Also the damping occurs when they're separated. But the fact that you see a fringe means that, that the, the spin was not completely scrambled in the, in the shuttling process. And uh, we couldn't put a, a fidelity number on here yet. We will uh, repeat these experiments in silicon and try to put a fidelity number on here. But I'm hopeful that this actually can be a very reliable method um, and, and very compatible with, with um, the quantum dot technologies. Instead of literally building quantum dot arrays that have to be tuned up one by one um, as a shuttling passage, what I envision out is that we will have a channel and gates that do not form quantum dots, but that form a traveling wave potential minimum or, or a traveling wave potential and, and an electron is then pushed in the traveling wave and gets pulled along, gets, you know, gets kind of propagated over the chip to the next, um, to the next uh, register or maybe to the one after you could imagine uh, having a bus lane where you can get on and off the bus in any register that you that you choose. Levin, we have a, a question from one of the uh, participants. So Andre, I'm just going to unmute you or off so you can talk. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, hi, Levin. Um, just a quick question. Um, can you comment exactly why this experiment is being pursued for Singalium arsenide? And um, what would be the difficulties going from gallium arsenide to silicon? Yes, right. So the, the main reason is that um, in silicon at the time we performed this experiment in 2017, um, uh, our community hadn't gotten to the stage where we could build and control, controllably load uh, more than two dots in a row. And, and um, you know, you could already learn a little bit from separating um, uh, or moving an electron between two dots, but that it's more convincing and you learn more uh, if you separate them out over more dots. In the meantime, uh, the PETA group at Princeton has shown um, a device with eight dots in a row in silicon. And, and they have also shown that they could push charges from one to the other. Actually, they push them through the array. Um, they didn't yet report on, on measurements of the, of the spin and how well it's preserved. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, this is just a matter of time before you will hear uh, such results. Yeah, thanks for the question. All right. Um, so then um, let me turn to the next point, which is integrating the classical electronics with the, the, the qubits on the same chip. There are two aspects here. One is to literally you know, develop, well, one is to develop electronics that functions at low temperature um, and, and second is to build electronics in a way that, that you know, you can really integrate it on the same chip with the uh, qubits. And third, are the qubits not going to heat up too much? And if so, how robust are the qubits to higher temperatures? Can we build qubits that are relatively hot? And I'm going to tell you more about the, the first and the third of the three that I showed. I'm not, uh, we have also worked 
and, and put papers out on, on getting qubits and classical uh, logic on the same chip. Um, I'm going to skip that and focus on the other two where we've gotten the furthest. So here's work um, uh, for mostly from, uh, well, it's really driven by my colleague Menno Veldhorst in, in, in Delft uh, on a two qubit device where um, we push the temperature up to over the Kelvin. And um, it actually has been remarkable to see very high quality two qubit controlled rotations um, for, uh, so, sorry, so basically the controlled rotation is, means or it works as follows. Uh, on, the, on the bottom right here, you see the energy level spectrum as a function of, you could say, gate voltage. It's, it's a gate voltage that um, effectively pushes the two electrons closer together uh, the, the more they move to the right. And as the two electrons overlap more and more, um, an exchange interaction acts on the spins and um, and, and it, well, and then there is also a, 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 an energy difference in the single qubit frequencies and, and you know, that combination leads to four separate frequencies um, for the transitions between the four basis states, uh, zero, zero through uh, one, one. And we can, if we selectively uh, drive one of those transitions, it, it basically is a controlled rotation. And, um, the single qubit fidelities, uh, if we turn off the coupling, are at 99% at, uh, at the Kelvin. Two qubit gate fidelities were here at 86%. Um, there is really room to do better. Um, it's not like uh, suddenly we, we necessarily have to take a big hit and it's not going to get better than 86%. It is going to get better. Uh, it, it remains to be seen, you know, uh, ultimately how far we can go. The, the main uh, effect of the higher temperature that we see is that our T1s get shorter. That was expected. It's been predicted for you know 20 years ago in theory papers. Um, but as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, on the T1 we have a lot of room. You know, it's it's a second, and we don't need a second. Uh, so if we compromise a bit on the T1, that's okay. The other thing that we see is that uh, charge noise gets more severe. It's partly thermally activated, so charges in the substrate uh, are shaken up by the higher temperature and, and uh, move from one random trap to another random trap. And in doing so, they, their effect on the quantum dots uh, has changed because they move to a different location. And, and so there is this random effect that's changing in time, uh, high, high frequency charge noise, low frequency charge noise. And, and that is um, uh, probably ultimately going to to, to limit our two qubit gate fidelity, the question is, you know, can we get to 99% and beyond? And, and, and uh, that's what we're trying to achieve. Um, a parallel experiment was published at the same time from, from UNSW on, on a single qubit uh, operation at, at uh, 1.5 Kelvin. Um, so that's you know, we're, well, that, that, that's the learning process on, you know, how, how robust are these qubits to temperature. <clears throat> but then here's the other question. Can we build electronics that is designed and operates well at cryogenic temperatures? And, and again, the vision is that ultimately these will be integrated on the same chip. As a big intermediate step um, with my engineering, electrical engineering colleagues in QTEC, Fabio Sebastiano, Eduardo Charbon and their groups, and with uh, Stefano Pellerano and his team at Intel, they have designed a actually really impressive cryogenic control chip that um, is able to modulate microwave signals, uh, put envelopes on them, frequency modulate them, um, have multiple tones come out uh, in parallel, uh, designed really for multi-qubit uh, for, for multi control. And, and the electrical specifications are such that if the qubits are perfect, uh, four lines of fidelity can be achieved. So uh, in the sense that, that the electronics would not limit us um, uh, until four lines of fidelity. A very impressive chip, you see an image here, four by four millimeter uh, is, is the actual dimension of the, of the chip, the, the, the little black piece here in the center. It's called uh, Horse Ridge after the coldest place in Oregon. Our Intel colleagues uh, are located in, in well, near near Portland, Oregon. And with this control chip, um, we have been able to uh, selectively address two qubits. Um, <clears throat> so so 
um, at, at different frequencies using frequency modulation, beautiful Arabi oscillations. Uh, we've also uh, made the control chip put out a sequence of instructions implementing the Deutsch Chosa algorithm. So, so it's actually uh, quite quite nice to see that this is possible and and um, how just how powerful and flexible this little chip is. Um, if you compare that with the massive, you know. Uh, boxes that we use now to control our, our qubits. Uh, there is a lot of room for for efficiency and, and compactness and so forth. And of course, in the end, for bringing the qubits and the electronics close together, um, that could be at an intermediate temperature. I don't know, maybe a Kelvin, two Kelvin. That's going to be a trade-off of, of, of many many uh, facets. Um, all right. So so this is yes, please. Um, let's check me. Uh, so is this, what, what, um, actual quantum device did you, did you use on this? Is this just one of your, uh, chips made in the cleaner or is there an Intel device? It's a, it's one of ours. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's a single layer, uh, double dots. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Fabricated by Nodar. Yeah. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, this is what I wanted to tell you about about you know the vision of a scalable quantum computer in in different aspects to it and and making it happen. And I want to transition if there are no more. Well, I, I see. Let's see. Are, are were there more questions? I, it looks like there are not. Okay, I'll I'll uh, leave it to Nathan and, and JP. Um, and I want to switch gears and tell you about a completely different use of the same devices, the same chips. If you look at the Hamiltonian that describes the electrons in the quantum dots or in the quantum dot array, you actually see that it is a implementation of the famous Fermi Herbert model, right? The electrons, of course, naturally are fermions. There's no encoding needing needed of, of making qubits behave like fermions. They are fermions by nature. Um, the simplest form of the Fermi Hubbard model consists of the two terms here. Electrons can move between the sides in a lattice, hopping, in our case, tunneling from one side to another. And then there is an energy cost associated with two particles, two fermions, uh, located on the same side. So these two by themselves are the core of the Fermi Hubbard model. And as it turns out, it is, um, well, nobody knows how to compute the ground state or the ground state properties of, of a 2D or 3D Fermi Hubbard uh, lattice. And at the same time, as I'll show you more in a moment, it's one of the biggest problems in condensed matter physics. In the quantum dots, we actually have two further um, uh, terms in the Hamiltonian. There is the long range interaction, which is also relevant for, uh, you know, when, when you try to simulate uh, real materials that, that uh, are described by the Fermi Hubbard model. The long range interaction, because the, you know, it's, it's a Coulomb interaction and, and, and it extends also to the neighbors and to the next neighbors. And then there is the flexibility of uh, shifting the local potentials up and down, and that's the first term here. Um, the first term is tunable by gate voltage, also the power coupling is tunable by gate voltage. The interactions are the result of the gate pattern and the gate voltages, but they are not very tunable by gate voltage. So we take these as fixed by design and the first two as, as tunable in situ um, uh, with gate voltages. Um, now, um, well, um, maybe I'll, I'll skip, well, let, yeah, let, me, let me kind of reverse the order here. You know, there is a lot of interest in, in simulating, understanding better Fermi Hubbard physics um, you know, it, it's, it's uh, largely based in trying to understand D-wave superconductivity, trying to see if it's possible to design superconductors at room temperature. Uh, it's one of the most complex problems in condensed matter physics and, and the planes in D-wave superconductors are well described by the Fermi Hubbard model. Um, you know, whether this, this is everything needed to describe D-wave is, is, is not clear. It's an open question, but this is certainly the starting point. Also, um, it's closely connected to quantum magnetism. 
um, and and um, there are many interesting questions about quantum spin liquids and so forth uh, that that arise from uh, Fermi Hubbard's physics ultimately. Um, now there is enormous work and beautiful work uh, with a variety of approaches trying to simulate this physics. There is the spectacular work with optical lattices for many years, more recently for with optical tweezers, also digital quantum simulation using jet lines or superconducting qubits. But now um, comparing, for instance, to the optical lattices, these are ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, but it's difficult for them to have, well, but the, you know, even though the temperatures are very cold, the energy scales are also very small, and it's difficult for them to achieve the regime where the temperature is much lower, the thermal energy is much below the hopping energy, where the hopping remains well below the on-site interaction energy. Whereas in the quantum dots, in a dilution refrigerator, that's actually where you get to quite, quite naturally. And so that's a big motivation uh, to see what we can learn using the quantum dots uh, for analog simulation of Fermi Hubbard uh, physics, in addition to you know, the fact that it gives complementary information than, than what comes out of ultra cold atoms, for instance. Um, and so with this motivation, we started working uh, five, six years ago on, on this, uh, in this direction. Um, and the first experiment that we performed was to implement a small scale version of uh, the transition between Coulomb blockade and, co and collective Coulomb blockade. Um, when you um, look at the images on the right for this small scale system, it, it, it's semi-trivial perhaps, um, but Coulomb blockade means that an electron here cannot move there if there is already an electron there, they repel each other. And they, they, you know, the Coulomb repulsion blocks them from, from moving around. Um, if you, instead of having individual sites and individual potential minima here, create one large potential minimum, then you know, within that the electrons can move around. But then um, uh, adding another electron from the outside is still forbidden because of the Coulomb repulsion. So now it's collective Coulomb blockade. The collective system uh, shows uh, uh, Coulomb blockade. Um, so this small scale version, perhaps it looks a little bit trivial, but it is actually really equivalent uh, to the uh, transition between a mod insulator at the bottom where every electron is stuck on its side and a metal where electrons can move within the system. So this metal mod insulator transition is, is a very you know, profound, important transition in condensed matter. And we have explored it in this, trip, in this three dot system in quite some detail. Um, um, actually, for the sake of time, let me maybe not go through uh, the detail and, and just tell you that, that we have studied this secret agreement between what we expected and what we see. And just to highlight the space that we've explored compared to typical spin qubit experiments, typically all of us work down here, one electron on each side and tunnel couplings of, let's say, one to 10 micro electron volt. But here we've gone out to hundreds of micro electron volt uh, we've gone out to 12 electrons in total, uh, four per site. Um, and and uh, yeah, so there's a lot of space here to explore um, in this system. Let me now turn to another experiment um, and tell you in a bit more detail about, about this one. And this is an experiment that uh, JP carried out when he was a postdoc in my group together with PhD student uh, Udi Mukopadjai. Um, what, what we set out to do, um, and this was proposed to us by, by Eugene, Eugene Demler at Harvard uh, when I was visiting there 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. What we proposed to do is to look for uh, signs of a form of magnetism predicted in 1966 by Nagaoka. And this form of magnetism is special in the sense that it arises purely from um, itinerant electrons. In most forms of magnetism that, that we know, there is always a component or, or a contribution from local, localized electrons interacting with each other. Um, and it's very hard to create conditions, even on paper, where electrons that are all free to move around still spontaneously uh, spin polarize and produce a ferromagnetic current state. For instance. Um, the smallest instance in which this Nagaoka ferromagnetism can be seen is a two by two plaquette. And like in, in, in the, well, you know, in, in Nagaoka ferromagnetism, what you do is you put one electron on every side, 
and you remove one. So for the plaquette, it means you retain three of the four electrons. And then we worked hard to, JP and, and Gudit worked hard to align the four potentials as good as we could, uh, as well as we could with each other. We had to satisfy some, some boundary conditions of having sufficiently large tunnel coupling and, and uh, interaction energies and so forth. Um, in the end, in the conditions that we operated, we expected a gap between the ground state and the first excited state of, let's say, four micro electron volts, something like that, which is um, comparable to, to the um, uh, thermal energy um, considering the electron temperature uh, in this, in this uh, setup. And um, let's see, for the sake of time, let me skip through some of this. So it was quite a bit of hard work initially to get working devices that, that allowed you know, to, to reach this parameter regime required for the experiment, but in the end, we were successful and um, proceeded as follows. Let me try to explain this. On the left, you see what we call a charge stability diagram, where the lines indicate changes in the stable number of electrons on any of the dots. And then the spaces in between um, are basically regions where, where you have a fixed number of electrons. For instance, one electron on dot one, one on dot two, no on dot three, and one on dot four in this region out here. At point N, that's where the three electrons could freely, freely move around. We call this the Nagaoka condition. At point M, we will both initialize and measure in a condition with two electrons on the first dot and then one on the fourth dot. When you do that, and that's shown, well, and if you move between point M and N and compute the expected energy spectrum or the low energy part of it, you get to the image on the right. Where at point M, the two electrons in the first dot will thermalize into the ground state singlet. And then there is an unpaired spin in the fourth dot, which is going to be in a random configuration. As we move towards point N, the ground state becomes the ferromagnetic state where the three spins are spontaneously spin polarized. So without an external magnetic field, all the spins uh, point in the same direction. It can be any direction, but they point in the same direction. Now, um, what we're going to do is to come from point M and move towards point N, either rapidly or slowly. If we move in very slowly, then we will use the fact that this crossing is, if you zoom in, a small avoided crossing and end up in the ground state. If we come in rapidly, we'll still be in the unpolarized uh, state up here. That's the expectation or the hope. Does it work? Well, uh, yes, it works quite well. Uh, here you see that as we come in uh, rapidly, we indeed, uh, well, we, we get a little bit of of increased triple probability, but for the most part, uh, we still have uh, uh, singlets. If we come in slowly, we have a much larger triple probability. So, so this is what we expected uh, from slow to fast, the, the, you know, we go from lots of triplets to fewer singlets. Here at the wings, we have uh, increased triplet fractions, um, even if we go in fast, and that's because at the wing here, you you are at these crossings, and at these crossings, the singlet and the triplets uh, rapidly mix. But then, you know, okay, this is good, this is what we expect, but is it really Nagaoka for a man, or is it something else? So, so we performed three tests to look into that. First is to change the topology. So by raising one of the tunnel barriers, we, we could really disconnect the lower two dots from each other. And so now it's no longer a ring geometry, but just a linear chain. And theory predicts that for a chain, the lead matter theorem says this, for a chain, the ground state should always be the low spin state, not the high spin state. And so indeed, we no longer um, have this increased triplet fraction as we uh, open up that barrier. We go from lots of triplets here at point N to a smaller difference and to eventually no more difference between pulsing and fast or slow. So that's, that's reassuring. Um, then, and I skipped over some of the, of the intuition behind this, um, 
uh, you can ask me uh, afterwards if you want, but the, the prediction was also that if you apply a weak magnetic field perpendicular to the plaquette, that the ground state would at some point no longer be ferromagnetic. That's actually curious, right? Normally, magnets get magnetized with a magnetic field, and here the prediction is that it gets demagnetized by applying a magnetic field. It's, it's a result of the honor of Bohm effect. I can explain the subtleties in more detail, although you may have also heard it uh, from, from JP. Um, in any case, we, we tried to experiment, um, and um, it's a bit complicated by the fact that, that, that uh, applying a magnetic field also introduces a Zeeman splitting. But nevertheless, the, the observations were consistent with what we expected. And then finally, we said, OK, now let's destroy the ferromagnetic ground state by locally offsetting one of the potentials upwards or downwards. Remember, we worked hard to line up all the four potentials as good as we could, because that's what you need for the, the, the ferromagnetic ground state. Uh, that's what we thought. Um, so now let's on purpose offset one of them here for dot one, dot two, dot three, and dot four. What we saw is that even if we shifted the local potential by 50 micro EV upwards or downwards, and 50 micro EV, mind you, that's several times larger than the hopping energy, where we definitely expected to destroy the, the, the um, ferromagnetic, ferromagnetic ground state, even so, we still observed a big difference in triplet fraction between pulsing and fast and slow. And so at this point, we really, we, we actually were, were very worried that, that, you know, something was wrong and that we had not been seeing ferromagnetism or nigocast magnetism, that there was something else going on that we had to understand. Um, we were really puzzled. But then we actually simulated numerically uh, what, what we should have been expecting. And it's exactly what we should have been expecting in great detail, including, you know, the range uh, over which you see a difference between the pulsing, between pulsing fast and slow, you know, the, the, basically the, 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 the distance between the crossings here uh, is different for, you know, when you shift this potential downwards versus upwards. And it happens in exactly the way as predicted by theory for all of the instances. So in the end, inst instead of being a demonstration that, that it's something else, it became, um, it gave us more confidence that indeed we're seeing this, this uh, Nagoka magnetism at work. So um, I'm very excited about this line of research with uh, an ERC grant uh, that I recently got. I'm gonna push it further, build it up further. Um, we are currently preparing to, to um, uh, create and measure ladder devices um, in triangular geometries. There can be spin frustration effects. It's it's very uh, you know it's it's a very rich field with many possibilities from spin frustration RGB states, spin quantum spin liquids to to more studies of ferromagnetism, but also many body localization and different incarnations can be implemented. Um, various quantum phase transitions can be probed. Uh, you know quantum criticality. So, so I think there is a lot to be, do, to be done here on these quantum dot arrays. In addition, and in parallel to building the qubits, these two subfields in my group, uh, you know, fertilize, cross-fertilize a lot, and, and um, I'm very keen to push it forward. So um, summarizing then the talk, in the first part, I've tried to sketch a vision that, that um, is really driving, guiding our research of, um, you know, how to build a quantum processor that can really reach the millions of qubits uh, and, and overcome the many fundamental and practical uh, obstacles on the way. Um, I think that the spin qubits are really well positioned to, to achieve this. Um, they are intrinsically very long lived, allow dense integration. We can have all chip networks with various methods. Uh, of course, it, it really directly leverages semiconductor technology and the multi billion investments that have gone into that. And, and we really see, as we move along with our community, one concept after another um, that, that enables this uh, being demonstrated. So I'm actually very uh, optimistic these days. Uh, you can read about this vision also, or, or well, you can read about the, 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 the development of our field, I would say, in this Physics Today article that I wrote with Mark Erickson last year. 
on the on the side of quantum simulations, uh, we've now shown that that not only dots can be used for quantum simulation, but they also allow have already allowed to study physics. And I didn't emphasize this yet, but that hasn't been seen in any physical system so far. This is not like a magnetism. Hasn't been seen with the ultra cold, ultra cold atoms, nor in real materials. It's it's physics seen for the first time, created and seen for the first time in this in this uh, plaquette on a small scale, but nevertheless. And so we're very keen to to uh, utilize the possibilities that this opens for for uh, for the future. So very importantly, many people contribute to this work over the years in my in my group. Uh, um, also, of course, in other groups that we collaborate with very closely for materials, for devices, uh, also for uh, theory uh, support, um, very fruitful and close collaborations. Uh, something that's weird. Something happened with the acknowledgments slide. It's not updated, uh, anyways. But but also very close collaborations with with. Um, uh, the groups of Giordano and uh, Menno at, at QTEC with my engineering colleagues, Fabio and Eduardo and their groups with the Intel team, Jim Clark's team, and also Stefano Pellegrano's team. Um, and yeah, so I updated this acknowledgement slide yesterday, but that really wasn't safe. Um, so with this, I would like to end. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to take further questions. Thanks. Thanks, Levin, for that really broad and outlook of, of your great work. <laughs> I'm always impressed of like, yeah, how you can summarize in an hour <laughs> all, of, all of the many projects that you have going on at the same time. Um, yeah, so um, I'll leave it the, uh, the, the meeting open for questions. Does anyone have any questions? Um, maybe I'll risk it and just let people unmute themselves. Uh, so just, if you have a question, just unmute yourself. Um, maybe I'll start with one. Uh, can you, can you give us a bit of an update of, of uh, how is it going with the Intel devices? Um, yeah. Um, we we continue to press, progress well from what we've uh, reported in the fall and um, yeah so so um, I'm, I'm happy with the, the progress and and um, yeah we'll we'll um, I'm sure be able to to show results that you'll excited that you'll be excited about uh, I don't know uh, later on. Yeah. Hey, Levin, maybe I have a question. What, with your um, quantum simulations experiments, what do you think um, are the key technical challenges you have to making these things operate better or more, more with higher fidelity to, to be able to scale them up more? Um, yeah, so I think it's two, two things. One is the, um, I think we, we are still improving it's happening, uh, the methods of calibrating all the parameters. So we have good methods of calibrating a tunnel coupling between two dots, for instance, and a tunnel coupling between two other dots and local potentials. But then um, to go from there and, and arrive at a regime where all of the tunnel couplings are calibrated simultaneously is not trivial. Um, JP knows about this from the two by two experiment that he did. But um, um, I think I think that's that's one area of, of uh, continuous learning and and being able to do this more and more accurately and extrapolate from local calibrations to a um, uh, globally calibrated uh, condition. Um, and the other is to um, come up with novel ways of, and, and it requires technical advances and maybe also conceptual new ideas uh, could still uh, come in uh, to, to probe the system, right? So um, uh, in the end, you, you want to probe the system. Um, the a natural way of probing it is, is um, the so-called Elsenman readout, where you can project every spin in the up-down basis. But that only works if you have a large magnetic field. 
where the Zeman energy dominates everything else. But if you have the Zeman energy dominating everything else, you get a, board, a very boring paramagnetic ground state. So you don't want that. You need other methods of readout. So we use what we call Pauli spin blockade, where you project pairs of spins in a single triplet basis. And what's nice is that we can project pair, um, multiple pairs simultaneously and look at correlations between them. Um, correlations are very important for many of these studies of quantum magnetism. Um, but to, to do that in a good way uh, on, a, on a larger array is something that we still have to, to um, partly find out as we go along um, how to do that. And um, yeah, and, and again, I think that, that there is almost for sure going to be new concepts that we haven't yet thought of that, that we will come up with as we, as we progress. And then, of course, it is just the sheer scaling of the fabrication and getting everything working. But that, you know, that, that's kind of a parallel development um, that we're also doing for the qubit work. Right. So with regard to these, um, these readout methods, um, it sounds like, uh, in some sense, the approach that you think you'll have to take is, is kind of an operational approach where you're using some mm -hmm. sense the, the physics that you're trying to see as a mechanism to characterize um, the performance of your chip or, or um, like, is, is that a, a, a reasonable way to think about it? That as, no. as the chips get more complicated, you have to kind of make these, use these more complicated uh, readout mechanisms that are related to what you're looking at? Yeah, exactly. So, so um, that, that is, uh, you know, from the theoretical point of view, one of the biggest uh, questions to ask and answer as we progress. What are the good, well, what, one thing is to do a measurement, another is to learn something from it, right? And, and um, for the two by two plaquettes, that, that was a small enough system that we could, as you can see, that, you know, diagonalize the Hamiltonian at least. It's, it's easy to do if you, if you leave out all the higher bands. Um, uh, Eugene's postdoc also did a simulation where he included higher bands and then it becomes already a very sophisticated and challenging numerical simulation. Um, but if you, if you break it down to the simple Fermi Hubbard model, it's, it's not so hard to do for the two by two plaquette and, and you can you know, use it to, to predict in detail what you should see and then check that against what you do see. But of course, our ambition is to get to the point where you can no longer predict what you should see. And, and then it becomes even more important to do the measurements in such a way that, that you uh, learn about the system and that you have confidence in um, what you, well, in, in the conditions that you have created. Um, so, so it's very important that, that we can do this calibration, the calibration of the parameter settings in a transparent and convincing way. And that we can, yeah, then, then ask questions such as for how, over what distance do spin correlations survive? These are questions that you can ask and answer and that are informative for understanding underlying physics. But, but we'll, we'll uh, certainly have uh, close theory collaborations uh, also as we proceed with these measurements to, to do meaningful interpretations. It's, it's by no means trivial. Yeah, and I guess this is a, 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 this experiment highlights that point because it, at some point you were thinking, no, no, this is not working. We're not seeing what we're supposed to. And yeah. only by doing the full calculation did you find out, oh, well, actually that is the right thing. And, and so you, yeah. you don't necessarily yeah. know. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly, uh, exactly right. And so, so we need enough confidence to, to know what we're doing and, and um, to, not, to not doubt ourselves. Um, and yeah, I, I really like this experiment because it was, um, uh, yeah, it, it brought in many of these aspects and questions that you come across when you do analog quantum simulation. And, and we could go through them, you know, we, we, we could resolve them uh, well. And uh, it's, it's been a great learning experience. Actually, one thing that I might add kind of as a small historical side note, um, as JP knows, I, uh, I admitted only after he and with it were successful in the experiments, only then did I admit that when we started it, I really wasn't sure that this was gonna work. You know, when we start a qubit experiment, I always think in advance it's gonna work because I, I know the physics and the physics has to work, you know. In, yeah. in reality, some experiments that we attempt don't work because of practical things or, you know, we, there's something that we don't get to work. 
but but fundamentally, I expect them to work. And here, it's really different physics from anything that I was used to and that I was familiar with. So I really was also from that point of view not sure like is this is really going to happen. And, and uh, so it was very satisfying. Yeah. That's a lovely thing to do to a new postdoc and a new new PhD student. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's, it's it, yeah, indeed, indeed. They made it happen. Somehow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Levin, I've got a question on uh, the 2D array that you mentioned. Um, you said you could address it with rows and columns, um, but is that only ever addressing one qubit at a time? Um, and then sort of extrapolating on that, could you maybe talk a bit about the multiplexing um, and, and how that's going to achieve, say, one million qubits? Yeah, so, um, yeah, good, good question. So the, the um, crossbar array does actually allow more than one qubit addressing at a time. Um, you could imagine, uh, for instance, uh, flipping an entire uh, column or row at a time or doing um, uh, other, you know, th there are other things that you can do simultaneously, but you can also already anticipate that that you don't have the same flexibility as you would if you had really individual control, right? So there is limitations in what you can do um, uh, in parallel, but there are things that, that you can do in parallel. What is interesting, and, and this is not what you're asking, but I want to point it out, is you can then uh, do a, an analysis and try to look for a threshold, and a fault tolerance threshold. And it turns out that in this crossbar scheme, the way we've come up with it, there is actually no threshold in the sense that the threshold says, the fault tolerance threshold, threshold says, okay, if you go beyond that, that error rate or, or below it, then as you make a system larger, at some point um, you will get um, um, fewer errors than, than, than before. And if you make it even larger, you get even fewer errors and so forth. And, and here it doesn't work like that because if you make a system larger, at some point, there is going to be more time between the operations. You need to do more things in sequence. And so there is no threshold uh, in, uh, in that sense. Luckily, um, from the analysis that, that um, Jonas and others did, it is still um, fault tolerant in the sense that, that, yes, you can do error correction and you can have logical qubit error rates below the physical error rates and, and so forth. And you can, you, know, you, can see, you, you can achieve the desired error rates in the end. Okay, so that was a side note. So now back to the, to the multiplexing. The way we envision it is that these crossbar addressing schemes are a first step in being efficient about wiring. You, for, for, for a, uh, let's say 100 by 100 qubit array, you only have 200 wires instead of 10,000 wires. So you have a gain there. Yeah, it's basically a square root of n gain for the local array. But then we still need multiple arrays of the chip, and that's where the multiplexing will come in. Um, the multiplexing also, of course, brings elements of, of um, or, or brings limitations to what you can do in parallel and what you cannot do in parallel. But many of the operations in, in, in an error correction cycle uh, are, are the same across the board, and, and that actually helps both at the crossbar level as and at the larger level. To, to still um, make it happen. So this is how we see it come together. Thanks. All right, any more questions? Well, if not, thanks again, Levin. Well, I'll clap on behalf of everyone. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome.